So once again, ladies and gentlemen, as we are about to begin, please take your seats and be ready for our conference or the Seoul Defense Dialogue. As we are about to begin, may I ask all the participants to now take their seats. Thank you very much. Yes, once again, we are about to begin with the 2021 Salt Defense Dialogue. So I ask all the participants to now take their seats. We will be beginning the 2021 Salt Defense Dialogue shortly. Thank you very much. Yes, welcome everyone to the first special session of the 2021 Seoul Defense Dialogue. My name is Shin Ji Ye, your MC for the next three days. Well, as the SDD is being constantly supported by the various stakeholders worldwide, we are providing the simultaneous interpretation. So, uh, well, for our viewers online, please select the language that you wish to listen to through our YouTube channel, the Ministry of National Defense, Republic of Korea. And those on site, please use the receivers on your desk in order to listen to the interpretation service. Well, today on our list, we have two special sessions being prepared, and now we will be kicking off the first one under the title Security Threats Posed by Climate Change and the Military Responses. And to moderate the session, we will be inviting to the stage Deputy Minister for Climate Change Kim Hyo-won from Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Republic of, of Korea, with a big round of applause. Please, ladies and gentlemen, give her a big round of applause. Well, yes, um, as the climate changes are quickly emerging as a new security threat, I am very confident that there will be a lot to be discussed throughout the session. So, once again, the Deputy Minister for Climate Change, Kim Hyo-un, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Republic of Korea, will be joining us on stage as the moderator, and all the panelists will be joining us online. So now, let me pass on the mic to our moderator. Thank you very much for the kind in introduction. And since I'm, I think we have social distance, therefore I'm allowed to take off the mask. And welcome to the Seoul Defense Dialogue 2021. And I'm very pleased to moderate this session titled Security Threats Posed by Climate Change and Military Response, which is very timely and important for all over the world. So, 2021 may be remembered as the year of natural disasters. A deadly flood killed tens of people in the United States. Nearly one million people lack of electricity and drinking water due to Hurricane Ida. And this summer, Greece uh, went through a disaster of unprecedented proportions as wildfires ravished the country. 
and dozens of people have died in Northwest Canada in the middle of severe heat waves. And the list is not exhausted. We still vividly remember the wildfires in California, Australia, and the tropical storm Grace in Haiti, cold wave slap in Texas, still many remain. So this means climate change is real. Scientists and experts have persistently warned that all these extreme weather events are taking place mainly due to climate change. Natural disasters also produce refugees and displaced people. Developing countries and poor people are most severely affected vulnerable groups by climate change. Climate change sometimes even become a root cause of conflicts. Therefore, today, this session, we will discuss mainly three topics. Impact of climate change on national defense and national security. I believe all of us agree that climate change is becoming human security issue. And secondly, we will discuss about appropriate military responses to conflicts and disasters caused by climate change. And finally, we will discuss possibilities of international military cooperation in dealing with climate change. We have excellent panelists who have strong expertise and experiences from both developed and developing countries. They are joining online. I would like to introduce them to you. Ms. Sharon Burke, Senior Advisor at New America Foundation from the United States. Sharon, can you wave your hand? Wonderful. Thank you. Very nice meeting you. And General Urs Gerber, President of Swiss Armed Forces Historical Material Foundation. Mr. General, please wave your hand. Very nice meeting you. Thank you. Next, um, General Tom Middendrop, Chair of International Military Council on Climate and Security from the Kingdom of Netherlands. Mr. General, please wave your hand. Very nice meeting you. Thank you. Next is Mr. Shafkat Munir, Head of Center for Terrorism Research from People's Republic of Bangladesh. Can you wave your hand? Thank you. Monsieur Nicolas Lugo, Director for International Development of French Military School Strategic Research Institute. Monsieur, can you wave your hand? Thank you. Wonderful, nice meeting you. Finally, Ms. Ambika Vishwan, I'm sorry, Ms. Ambika Vishwanath, Director of Kubernetes Initiative from India. Great, thank you very much. Let's start our discussion. Let me give first a question to all of you. Due to time limit, I would like to ask you to respond briefly, preferably within five minutes. As I introduced, the accelerating impact of climate change is quickly emerging as a new security threat. So what is, in your view, the biggest impact of climate change on national defense and national security. I think it may be different depending on specific national circumstances, country by country. So we may start from the United States. Sharon, are you ready? I'm ready, Minister. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to the Seoul Defense Dialogue. I'm delighted to join you. And you know, to answer your question, the biggest impact on national defense is really the comprehensive way that climate change undermines and destabilizes societies. And that has implications for hard security or for military missions, but also for human security and the way we all live. If you look at the big picture, humanity's enjoyed a relatively stable climate for a long time, for more than 10,000 years. And that's allowed the human population to grow from a few million people just scattered across an unforgiving earth to almost 8 billion today, uh, 8 billion people today, about two thirds of whom have cell phones. 
Well, climate change disrupts all of that, that stable climate that we've depended on to develop. And while it's not something that we can defeat through force of arms, it may well result in military missions. And that can range from humanitarian and disaster relief to stabilization to combat. And the, but what's interesting about this is that the best defense against climate insecurity right now, however, is investments in economic development that will make societies more resilient to the changes that are unavoidable, that are already locked into the system, but also investments in the innovation that will bring us to a post-industrial future. And the challenge is that if the nations of the world are unable to cut greenhouse gas emissions, and that's a, a real responsibility for both the United States and the Republic of Korea, if we're not able to do this, if we fail, then militaries should be planning for profound insecurity and more military missions later in this century or possibly sooner if we hit certain tipping points. The most recent United Nations report profiled a dozen tipping points that would signal irreversible and abrupt climate change, where that would be a very sudden shift in, in the security environment. Some of these tipping points are the collapse of ice sheets, the slowing of the Atlantic current, or the release of significant methane from melting permafrost. And I think what we have to take very seriously as military organizations in particular is that all of those changes are underway. So this is a very uncertain environment and we have to be prepared. Thank you very much. Yes, as you mentioned, the main aim of national defense is for survival and climate change is threatening actually human beings survival. So let me just invite our uh, next uh, panelist. So General Ruth Gerber, I think you also have a view regarding the biggest challenge to the national defense uh, in the aspect of climate change. The Minister, for giving me the opportunity and your kind uh, invitation. Land is a landlocked country surrounded, even embedded in a comparatively stable zone of relative peace, prosperity, and stability, and has to deal with different security related challenges caused by climate change, and for instance, Southeast Asia, the Arctic, or Antarctica. And yet, even tiny Switzerland is ever increasingly affected. Though a tangible fact since quite some time, the perception of climate change in terms of relevance and impact is varying considerably. This holds true particularly also in Switzerland. Even though and indirect effects of climate change affected our country, particularly again this summer 2021. But just recently, a pretty moderate legislation on combating climate change, mainly through carbon reduction measures, has been rejected by the Swiss electorate. Nevertheless, climate change is an ever increasing issue in this year's security policy report of the government. It recognizes security implications, particularly with the melting of glaciers, with the decline of permafrost, flooding, fires and other disasters related to increasingly extreme weather situations. Direct and indirect impacts of migration flows as consequence of climate change or conflict in heavily affected parts of the planet might affect Switzerland also with regard to security. Furthermore, an ever increasing population density and climate change related new vectors of diseases or health problems are likely to affect security relevant implications without a direct impact on the armed forces, at least at the first glimpse. But nevertheless, climate change is a security related troublemaker in Switzerland uh, as well. Given the overarching national target in combating climate change of achieving, of achieving carbon neutrality in 2015, a 50 Securing energy throughout this period and beyond is considered probably the most important element, particularly also for the armed forces. 
civilian and military operations in handling or even preventing about above mentioned kinds of disasters are only feasible with sufficient energy available at home and abroad. Thank you. Thank you very much. So you shared that the uh, Swiss government is well prepared to develop climate change strategy regarding national defense and security. So let me move to the other country, uh, General Midendrop. I think you also have many things to share regarding your country's experience. So thank you very much. And I would like to compliment the organization for choosing this subject to future-proof your security policies. I think climate change is uh, the game-changer of this century, also shaping our security environment. Mm -hmm. I hope that more countries will follow your example. Uh, to me, it's very clear that climate change is a matter of national and international security. I come from a country where more than half of the population lives below the sea level. We devote a large portion of our annual budget to protection against the sea. So you can imagine that sea level rise is a big issue in a country like the Netherlands, but there are many more countries in the world facing this uh, threat. I also represent a global military network called the International Military Council on Climate and Security, the IMCCS. And this network consists of generals, admirals, security experts from more than 40 countries in all regions of the world. And we share experiences. We have all seen uh, in conflict areas and in fragile uh, countries what the impact is of our climate. In Afghanistan, we have experienced how water scarcity uh, leads to friction and gave, gives the Taliban a breeding ground and entrance into villages. In Africa, in Somalia, in Mali, in, uh, in Sudan, uh, we have seen how herders and farmers were driven away from their homes much more than an environmental problem. It is the biggest game changer of this century. And I cannot remember any other conflict in my military experience where we had this level of scientific foresight. We know what's coming to us. So we have a responsibility to prepare and we have a responsibility to adapt. And if the COVID crisis should learn us one thing, it is the importance of being prepared. It is the importance of not wasting time. We live in a global village and global problems demand global answers. And of course, the paradigm is that we all want to protect our national interests, but at the same time, there is an increasing need for multilateralism. And it requires us to cooperate, to cooperate on areas where our interests overlap. So we need to seek that cooperation. It affects our national security in many ways. It affects us geopolitically, with a new run for resources, new scarcities, scarcity of water and food, scarcity of rare minerals. Uh, it affects our uh, geopolitically because balances of power will shift. The energy transition changes the position of OPEC countries, changes the Um, General, Mr. General, um, unfortunately, uh, we cannot hear you. M Mr. General, can you hear me? I think there is a technical um, issue at this moment. Um, Mr. General, can you look at can you look at me waving my hand? Maybe any technician at this room can help me or can help him to be connected. Mr. General, can you look at me waving my
can you hear me, uh, the panelist? Can you hear my voice? If you if you hear my voice, just please just raise your hand, because we. Thank you very much, because we have some issues, uh, technical issues with the general button drop, because we lost uh, the last part of his intervention. And general button drop, can you hear me now? It seems um, he cannot hear me. Um, uh, Mr. General, anyway, thank you very much. Uh, I think I, I would like to visit you later. By the way, at this moment, in order to go forward, I would like to invite next speaker, uh, Mr. Shafkat Munir uh, from the Republic of Bangladesh for sharing uh, his view uh, regarding climate change threat to the national security, particularly from this, the perspective of developing country expert. So Mr. Munir, uh, the floor is yours. Can you hear me clearly? Can you just speak up? Uh, yes, can you hear me now? Yes, very good. Thank you. I was having some audio difficulties earlier. Minister, thank you very much for having me in this conference and my compliments to the organizers for selecting this topic. It's a real honor to be part of the Seoul Defense Dialogue. I think as the previous speakers have already stated that we are no longer at a stage when we can just call it climate change. I would much rather prefer to call it climate crisis because we are at a stage when we are facing one of the gravest crises of our generation. I come from Bangladesh, a country which is at the front line of this climate crisis, where according to various estimates, a two meter or a 1.5 meter rise in sea level will potentially see the displacement of up to 30 million people and a loss of 14% of Bangladesh's total land mass. Uh, Bangladesh is a very uh, large country in terms of population, but not a very large country in terms of land mass. So a 14% uh, loss of land mass in what is already one of the most densely populated countries in the world, as you can imagine, ladies and gentlemen, it's going to be a very grave disaster. So when we talk about uh, what are the biggest impacts of climate change on national defense and national security, we see it in two parts. First of all, what does it mean for overall national defense? And what I see is that, as uh, the esteemed speakers before me have already talked about it, but I just want to add to another angle of this question, is what kind of impact will it have for future military operations? whether due to sea level rise, future military operations are going to be hindered, whether the unusability of jetties for navies or topographical change on land, that is one question. The second is whether excessive heat is going to render many of the military equipment useless. And we are already seeing some of that in action. In Mali, for instance, in a recent report uh, undertaken by the Bangladeshi media, we saw that our peacekeepers, we have a large peacekeeping presence in Mali, they're unable to use many of their communication devices until the evening, until the temperature cools off. Because the devices that they're using, whether it is cellular telephones or other communication devices, are just not made to uh, withstand that kind of heat. So this is just probably a precursor of what we are likely to see in the coming days in terms of excessive heat impeding the performance of various types of military equipment. Then we come to the second question is, what kind of future operations will the militaries have to deal with, which would be exacerbated by factors related to climate change? The previous speakers, particularly General Middendorp, has very aptly highlighted that how climate change is one of the biggest threat multipliers of our time, and how a situation which initially arises out of a climate change related issue then relates to either increase in extremism or eventually resulting in conflict. 
So whether it is the case of enforced, uh, whether it is the case of forced displacement due to sea level rise or uh, climate change, or we are going or uh, conflict over resources or civil unrest or countries going to conflict with each other over resources because resource scarcity has been exacerbated by climate change. These are all issues that the militaries will have to deal with. And again, that's why I'm particularly heartened that the Seoul Defense Dialogue has selected this topic. Mm -hmm. And we look to the Republic of Korea to provide lead, greater leadership in furthering this whole issue of mainstreaming the role of security implications of climate change and the increasing role of the armed forces. It is no longer a scientific issue. It is no longer just about adaptation or mitigation, but we have to bring the security implications of climate change front and center. And from my perch in Dhaka, Bangladesh, climate change is not a theory because we live it every moment. I think I'll stop there and uh, come back again for the next question. Thank you. Thank you very much. I completely agree with you uh, regarding the your argument that climate change is no longer an environmental issue, it's it's security issue for all humankind. So let me invite next uh, panelist, Monsieur Nicolas Hugo, Director for International Development of French Military School Strategic Research Institute. So I think you also have uh, the strategic view regarding the climate change impact on national defense. Please, floor is yours. Thank you, Minister. I would like first to, to thank the Korean Ministry of National Defense for its kind invitation. Uh, firstly, I'd like to stress that climate change is not a threat in the traditional sense because it doesn't have any hostile intent. That is what differentiates risk and threat. Climate change or climate disruption, I agree with uh, General Mendendo, is a major risk that amplify the risk and threats. Some countries are concerned that the most fragile and least resilient will certainly be the most affected. The major impact of climate change is therefore to increasingly affect the stability and security of the most fragile countries, which in return will affect regional balances and consequently international peace and security. Some countries, you know, uh, risk their very existence, notably the small island states in the Pacific and Indian Oceans. Sea level rise and aridification will lead to the displacement of millions of people, thus affecting national socio-political balances and possibly those of neighboring countries. It has been said natural disasters of increasing intensity in number will affect all countries leading the armed forces to devote more and more resources to the protection of their national interests, the people, territory, resources, in support of civil security forces, but also to international HADR operations. I'd just like to illustrate this by the French case. France is to a certain extent an archipelago country with territories and population scattered over almost all the oceans from the Caribbean to the Pacific and Indian Oceans, where 2.7 million national live. These overseas territories are mainly located in tropical regions, particularly vulnerable to the consequences of climate change, in particular extreme weather events and rising sea level. In these areas, the French armed forces have the second largest global network of military installations and support facilities located in dozen countries and territories whose exposure to climate risk is potentially high. These installations are particularly at risk, which in turn will affect their capacities in the military mission they support. The French armed forces are also engaged in numerous military and peace operations in tropical or arid zones in the Sahel, in the Gulf of Guinea, in the Middle East, for instance, regions where the most particularly affected by climate change but also in the implementation of HADR operation worldwide, in particular in the Caribbean and the Indian and Pacific Oceans. Climate change will affect operational and support mission implement. Moreover, the French 
Navy plays a central role in the surveillance and protection of maritime areas and in the fight against illicit activities at sea, such as IUU fishing. This Coast Guard function represents almost uh, one fifth of French Navy operational activities. Climate change will increase the pressure on already overexploited fishery, fishery resources in many regions and thereby the importance of the fight against illegal fishing activities in water under French jurisdiction, and those of many partner countries of France which do not have sufficient means of surveillance and protection. As you see, climate change or climate disruption will increasingly impact national defense and security in a high number of them. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing uh, Frank's uh, strategy and responses. Uh, let me invite uh, last speaker, uh, Ms. Ambika Vishwanath from India. You also have a view regarding the, the climate change impact to national security. Please, floor is yours. Thank you, Minister. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. Good. Yes, uh, thank you. Greetings to everybody from uh, Delhi uh, in India. Um, and thank you, Minister, and thank you uh, to the Seoul Defense Dialogue for inviting me. And many congratulations on the 10th anniversary of this very important dialogue. Uh, the advantage of having a last name that begins with V is that it makes my job quite easy um, in that I must first agree with almost everything that all the other panelists before me have said. Um, so what I'm going to do is to pick up on a couple of things and just add to them, which I think would be more beneficial than uh, um, reiterating uh, what everybody else has said. Um, and so I'm going to pick up one on uh, what uh, General Mirindop said about a global village, um, what Shafkat said about the fact that we in South Asia live climate change every day. For us, this is not a new security threat. Uh, this is life as we know it now. Um, and also what Sharon said about um, resources. Uh, climate change is not any more something that is, you know, the purview of the scientific community or the academic community um, or researchers like myself um, or the think tank uh, community. It is something that is part and parcel of everyday life. We've already heard this from, from a couple of the other panelists. But what does that mean? And I want to just put a different spin on to what um, resources and, and, and uh, what we mean by, by security threats. And to add on to that, it means also lack of access. Uh, what, is, what is lack of access when you look at, at uh, India or Bangladesh or a, country or, or a region like South Asia? Lack of access here equals to uh, flooding, which then leads to lack of water resources. Uh, when you have drought, when you have drought that we've seen, uh, the extreme kind of drought that we've, we've seen many times in South Asia, but now we're seeing it in, in, um, in parts of, of America, that also then leads to lack of access to water. Uh, you have high increasing temperatures, uh, water becomes an issue over there. Um, when you have sea level rise, which then leads to flooding um, in many coastal cities around the world, um, that also then becomes a issue for cities to manage. Um, it becomes a problem. And if you talk about resilient cities, it's then lack of access again to water, to energy, and to a number of different areas. So this lack of access, I think, is something that we need to place in that larger conversation of climate change and climate security. And, and why do I stress on this? Because this is no longer something that citizens can deal with on their own. It's about how your cities deal with it. It's about how your states, and when you come from a large country like India or America, you have states also and, and municipalities that deal with these issues. Um, but it's also then about your nation. But then it needs to be wider. It's about an international or regional response. Um, and so I wanted then sort of stress on that climate change and, and national military response really needs to be climate change, climate threats, climate security, and regional and international military response. Um, and why does that become important? Because speaking from, from 
the region that I am, and, and I know Shafkat will agree with me on this one, is that anything that's happening in this region affects everybody in this region. Um, and I'll give this one uh, statistic that I just came across a, a few days ago. Uh, in the Hindu Kush Himalayan region, there are 47 potentially dangerous glacial lakes. Uh, this now is something we're studying um, at, at my um, institute here in India. Uh, and what does that mean? A potentially dangerous glacial lake equals to glacial flood bursts, uh, which then leads to flooding down rivers, uh, landslides, which then affects your communities. And this is not just in one country, but it's in Nepal, it's in Bhutan, it's in India, it's in China, it's in Pakistan, it's in Bangladesh. So we can no longer think of the response in terms of what a national response might be, but what a regional response might be, and then what an international response might be, because what can we learn from uh, other countries that might have been dealing with similar issues? How can we work together? Uh, all of this then leads to what's happening in the Indian Ocean region, which then comes back to what um, uh, um, the general was talking about, you know, the French army being over here, the, sorry, the Navy. Uh, how are they going to get affected, right? So it's all interconnected in that sense. And so it goes back to what General Mirinov very rightly said about us being a global village. So I just, I wanted to sort of, highlight some of these um, these issues that others have brought about and, and talk about how everything then comes back to lack of access, which then equals to human security, and how are we going to deal with it as, as, um, as countries coming together, because this is not something that we can deal with as nations individually anymore. And I'll, and I'll stop there and, and uh, we can come back to more in the next round of questions. Thank you again, Minister. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing your view. Uh, since we lost uh, the last part of General Medendrov, uh, if you allow me, I would like to invite General Medendrov again. Uh, Mr. General, unfortunately, we lost the last part of your intervention. Therefore, if you don't mind, just can you quickly share the conclusion of your intervention for all audiences? Because your, your contribution is precious to all of us. <laughs> Well, no, no problem, of course. Um, my, my last part was about the comparison with the, the COVID crisis. I think we have learned from the COVID crisis that it is important to be prepared and to not let time slip through our fingers. Um, and the, we all live in this global village that I, I mentioned before, where and global answers, global problems demands uh, global answers. And the paradigm is that protecting our national interests uh, requires more multilateralism. So on the one hand, we are, are very focused on national agendas and we want to protect them. Uh, we are becoming more protectionists. Uh, on the other hand, it will require international cooperation to deal with it. So we have to bridge that gap. Uh, and it requires us to cooperate on those areas where our national interests overlap. And climate change is one of these areas where we can find that cooperation. Uh, it affects our national security in, in many, many ways. It affects our national security geopolitically because there will be a new run for resources, the new scarcities will be access to water, will be access to rare minerals. Uh, it affects our uh, security geopolitically because of shifting balances of power. Uh, for instance, energy transition will affect the uh, position of OPEC countries and countries like Russia. Uh, and uh, the whole melting of the uh, polar caps uh, is opening up completely new lines of communication uh, and is opening up new arenas with new runs for resources. So that's the geopolitical impact. And then there is the direct impact of flooding, severe weather incidents, bringing disruptions in, in many of our countries threatening vital infrastructure and increasing the demand upon the military to deliver humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. And lastly, there is the indirect effects because climate change is a big risk multiplier. It is a fertilizer of instability uh, and it is destabilizing, especially the fragile countries that have poor governments, poor institutions, but are also hit hardest by the effects of climate change, thereby also providing breeding grounds to extremist organizations 
and increasing the level of uh, migration flows. Uh, so to me, the term climate change doesn't really reflect the magnitude of its effects that we can expect. Uh, and I think we should change that term into climate disruption. That would be a better label. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for all. Uh, thank you for your various, uh, your valuable contributions uh, by panelists. So if I just wrap up the first discussion, round of discussion, we all agree that climate change is a game changer in security environment, not only in one country, regionally and globally. Therefore, urgent actions are necessary to effectively respond to this uh, challenge. And many countries are already taking actions. Um, and and uh, thank you for sharing your specific experiences as well. I mean, if so, my next question is regarding what actions actually military is taking to reduce greenhouse gas emission. Because we all agree that the main cause of climate change is uh, the greenhouse gas emission by human beings, human activities. And military forces, uh, it seems definitely um, emit a lot of greenhouse gases. Uh, in order to effectively implement Paris Agreement, governments and private sectors, they are working very hard. Uh, many global companies, they already announced carbon neutrality by 2050, and they are joining early 100 or EV 100. So my next question is regarding, milit regarding, regarding greenhouse gas emission reduction measures from military side. So, and, and so far, it seems that it's difficult to, to track the greenhouse gas emission by armed forces uh, because many of their activities are confidential. However, uh, I strongly believe that armed forces must join global efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emission. In that sense, what steps the military forces should take in order to contribute to the global efforts of fighting against climate change. So maybe Sharon, you can start first because US is now leading the global action against climate change. Thank you, Minister. I, well, I think, first of all, you know, I want to, one of the things you said about that there may be sensitivities involved, just to clarify, you know, a, a profile on the energy use or the emissions at a specific military base or an operation that may pre present some security risks, but there is no risk at all in making aggregate military greenhouse gas emissions public. In fact, I would say that it's entirely appropriate, especially in a, in a democratic society, you know, the, where trust and transparency are part of our value proposition that we make the, those that information public. Uh, for the United States, um, the US already publishes data on uh, military energy use every year, and um, it is it is a significant amount of energy consumption um, to clarify for a single institution, and it's about 2% of US consumption and, and a, a you know comparable part of greenhouse gas emissions, but that compares to a single airline. So it it's still civil society is the most important actor when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions. But the defense organization, the Department of Defense in the US has a really important role to play too. And the Biden administration is, is very likely to require much more accurate greenhouse gas reporting um, from uh, not only US forces, but also from private companies that do business with the Department of Defense. They have already signaled that they will ask private companies to report on their own conduct and also their, their supply chain. So that's a, a big change that's that's coming. Um, I think the tricky part for, for military organizations is setting greenhouse gas reduction targets, because it, on the one hand, you don't wanna constrain ahead of government's ability to use force wherever necessary, whether that's to for a um, humanitarian mission or to defend the country. And at the same time, you also don't wanna set carbon targets that everyone knows are gonna be ignored at the first sign of trouble. But what's really important is those goals do not have to be in opposition. In fact, they cannot be since nations need to be able to defend themselves and they also need to cut greenhouse gas emissions. 
So many of the technologies and the institutional changes that are going to move armed forces towards carbon neutrality will also make them better fighting forces for the 21st century. So, for example, a more energy efficient forest has a less vulnerable supply chain, you know, and we're in a time where um, adversaries can very precisely target supplies. So, if you have a very large liquid fuel supply chain, you're a vulnerable military inherently. So, a more energy efficient force is a better force. Also, you have new technologies such as unmanned systems that can harness different kinds of energy, whether, you know, solar panels, batteries fuel cells, hydrogen fuel cells, green hydrogen. There's a lot of different um, ways to power, not only to power those technologies, but it also gives you other benefits, lower signature, more range, more endurance. Um, I, mean, I also believe that militaries should be investing in next generation mobility. Now that's for reasons of military efficacy, given the kind of world that we're in and the nature of the threats that we face, but it's also practical as far as readiness for a post fossil fuel world and also to do to do your part as a military to promote climate security. So I think that there are many reasons why militaries can not only understand their greenhouse gas emissions, but get them under control. And you know, I think you'll see an increasing move towards that. The NATO Secretary General has said that they're looking at how to decarbonize the alliance. Um, the United States is looking at these things. I think that this is an area that's ripe for for uh, collaboration, certainly in the U.S.-Korea alliance. Uh, we need to be interoperable. We can help each other, not only on this, but also on understanding exactly the nature of this threat and how it's going to shape the future environment with that analysis, with uh, being prepared for more humanitarian and disaster relief operations. These are things that we will need to do together and that we can do together. So I think that there's a lot of room here for military organizations to lead the way. Thank you very much. Yes, um, technology development and innovation uh, that can contribute uh, to the greenhouse gas emission reduction, even in military side as well. And I also, sometimes I think um, the military, they can lead the technology breakthrough as well. So now I would like to uh, invite General Gerber, maybe from the Swiss perspective, you have, uh, can you just share your views regarding what actions military must do in order to reduce carbons? Thank you, Minister, for the question. Uh, as other armed forces, the Swiss armed forces are by no means exempt from meeting uh, these kind of targets. I would even go uh, that far by saying that uh, compared to other government institutions, and big enterprises. The armed forces in Switzerland are maybe not the leading agency, but are at least in the leading pack of institutions to take seriously. Uh, these uh, targets uh, that I mentioned before, uh, just last week, the Swiss Minister of Defense reiterated the target for achieving carbon neutrality for the forces by 2015. Wow. 50. By 2030, it should be reduced by 50%. In the Swiss case, there are no restrictions, as uh, Sharon mentioned, as a, a democratic country. There are no restrictions in publicizing the armed forces' carbon footprint, just on the opposite. As a recent overall survey of the Swiss Ministry of Defense revealed, a footprint of roughly 210,000 metric tons, plus about 30,000 metric tons for food consumption, for a total force of around 120,000 troops plus MOD civilian staff per year. If you compare the share of this uh, footprint, we have seen that air traffic accounts for more than 50%. Ground traffic is at 24%. Heat production at 17%. Then a thing that is related to the uh, full conscript force system in Switzerland, we have to reckon the conscript traffic that enters into service every year, that accounts for 6%, and electric power, last but not least, for 2%. Those comparatively modest level improvements towards the 2050 target have been achieved, such as, 
And here are measures that have been started uh, by at least uh, 10 years ago and some uh, quite recently. I would mention five of them. First, an increased simulation training compared to full uh, unit uh, trainings allows a reduction of fuel consumption as well as a qualitative improvement of the training. Secondly, since 2010, Jet pilot candidates have been training on PC-21 turboprop-powered trainers before continuing their training on the FA-18 fighter aircraft. The PC-21 aircraft thus replaces the F-5 Tiger in training. This configuration, unique in the world, has many advantages. It saves its costs, reduces fuel consumption to one-ninth, and pollutant emissions to one-tenth in total. Since 2000, the marching orders for conscripts could be used as a public transportation tickets in order to take uh, people entering into service away from using their private cars. Fourth, currently 100% of the electric power consumption of the Ministry of Defense originates from renewable energies mainly hydraulic uh, power. And lastly, new construction and renovation of MOD and Armed Forces buildings have to follow durability prescriptions of the so-called Minergy uh, program, who tries to minimize uh, the energy consumptions of these buildings. Uh, the above-mentioned Energy Strategy 2050 of the Swiss MOD and the Armed Forces implies specific targets as follows. Continuous effort to reduce CO2 emissions. No buying any more of emissions reduction certificates. Exploration of new sources of energy. And last but not least, shift of at least a part of the defense forces towards these new energies. Hence, challenges of climate change and reduction of the uh, uh, carbon footprint of Switzerland and its armed forces is taken uh, very seriously, uh, even though we know that uh, it's a uh, uh, very high toll. We have to achieve it, uh, this because if we want to intervene or support and contribute to, uh, to ease the threats and challenges of uh, climate disruption, as General Mittendorf mentioned, the armed forces need to be prepared to uh, act in these new environments with much more reduced uh, carbon footprints, which should be neutral by 2050. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. General. Um, thank you for sharing very ambitious target of Swiss government, uh, Swiss military sector uh, in carbon reduction. And also, uh, it's, I'm glad to hear that serious actions are being taken by your military forces. So let me invite General Medendrop again. Uh, I think Netherlands also has, Netherlands, the military forces uh, may also have uh, ambitious target and are taking many actions. Can you share some of them with us? Uh, I wish they had, to be honest, but they don't. Oh. So this is uh, still a way to go. Um, I agree with Sharon that the uh, contribution of the military to national emission levels is only 2%. So one would say, why bother? Uh, national defense is also very important, so we should accept that. But that uh, is not acceptable because at the same time, um, the military is the largest single CO2 producer in any country. And typically, the military emissions rate about 50% of the overall government carbon emissions. So there is a big responsibility for the military to contribute to reducing emissions. Uh, and this is not an easy challenge, and it will run into a lot of resistance because reducing emissions could directly affect the effectiveness and the readiness of mission critical capabilities. Many of these capabilities have long life cycles way beyond 2015. And several niche capabilities, such as space launched uh, systems, have uh, high emission intensities. 
uh, for which there are no alternatives yet. So how to deal with that? How can we reduce carbon levels without reducing, without affecting the operational effectiveness of our armed forces? Or with even increasing that effectiveness, as you rightfully said. And I think it would be helpful if we divide uh, the different types of military capabilities in different groups. And the easiest way is to start with non mission critical capabilities where defense forces can benefit from the development of low carbon civil technologies. And examples are the heating and energy supply of peacetime military infrastructures such as barracks and offices. And another example is the electrification of the so-called white fleet of all the civilian vehicles that we have in the military institutions. So especially on the home basis and the barracks in our countries, we can uh, reduce emissions in the same way as the civil society is reducing it. A second group would be mission essential capabilities that can be addressed without affecting operational readiness. And there are many capabilities where you can um, uh, use the energy transition to change without affecting that readiness. Uh, and let me give you a few examples. The first one is the lighter combat vehicles that can be electrified in an energy neutral way. Uh, another one is military compounds. Uh, here in the Netherlands, we are establishing a so-called field lab smart base. Uh, and this field lab smart base offers kind of a platform for innovation. It's a military smart base offering a platform for innovation for tech companies, for research centers, for universities. And they all come together with one aim, to build a, and develop a military base that is completely self-sustaining by using all kinds of different civil technologies and by combining them in new concepts. And doing that means that defense can also act as a platform for innovation because all these innovations and these new concepts developed in this field lab can also be used civil. So it's a dual use way of developing technologies. Uh, but also robotization and the increased uh, use of unmanned systems uh, help the military to reduce emissions without affecting uh, the uh, operational readiness. So that's the second group. And a third group I would like to mention is a more difficult group of mission essential capabilities, uh, like I, what I mentioned before, the launch of space-based systems, but also jet aircraft, uh, for which there are no technological alternatives yet. And on these areas, it might be necessary to accept a certain levels of emissions uh, up to 2050 and look for other ways to compensate them. For instance, by storing uh, CO2 in, in the grounds of training areas or by using defense uh, real estates to generate renewable energies. Uh, so in this way, the military can compensate for those emissions that they cannot yet reduce. And if you do it in these three ways, I think we can follow a few steps. It all starts with uh, building awareness or, and generating data. And I agree with Sharon that there is no need to uh, keep that classified. Uh, and based on that, we can rank them into these categories, all the capabilities, and uh, review our investment plans to identify those capabilities that need to be replaced in the coming time frame uh, and focus our R&D programs. So whether we like it or not, defense forces need to be part of the government-wide mitigation efforts, and we should see it as an opportunity and not as a threat. Thank you. Thank you, General Mbidendrop, uh, for sharing um, military forces' uh, carbon emission reduction efforts and also challenges, actually, the military forces are facing. Uh, let me invite Mr. Munir uh, for sharing his views. By the way, I would like to uh, invite you to rather focus on uh, how to help developing countries. Uh, 
um, the developed countries, they have technology, they have strategy, they have capacity uh, to take actions. However, uh, in many cases, developing countries, although they have very uh, strong political willingness to reduce carbons in military operations, in armed forces sector, however, uh, they are not well uh, equipped uh, or prepared with proper capacities. Therefore, what international community can do to help developing countries uh, in achieving carbon uh, emission reduction in armed forces as well? So floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's a very important question. And uh, I think uh, we really have to focus on the armed forces reducing its emissions. Again, uh, as you have very correctly stated, uh, for developing countries, the challenge is much greater. First of all, an argument that you are going to hear from developing countries is our overall emission levels are so low. So why are we being asked to actually do this? And that's an argument that has been going on in climate negotiations for many years. But the reality is, uh, as General Middendorp has so aptly uh, illustrated before all of us. It's a global problem, and it requires a global effort. And just as you rightly said, Chair, earlier, that the private sector and other organizations have already stepped forward. So it is absolutely important that the military also needs to step forward and play its role. One of the areas where developing countries can actually receive a lot of assistance is in terms of capacity building. Capacity building in terms of how to uh, be more aware about reducing energy emissions, how to make more uh, green facilities, if I may put it that way, how to make our uh, combat and non-mission critical equipment more environmentally friendly, and also technological support to achieve these goals. If the military wants to reduce its footprint in terms of uh, environmental pollution or greenhouse gas emissions, it won't be sufficient that if militaries in developed countries are only doing it. It needs to be an effort which also needs to be replicated in countries which are not so developed. And again, I'm very uh, impressed to see the great strides that have been made in Switzerland and the Netherlands and possibly in France and other parts of Europe as well. But when it comes to South Asia or Southeast Asia, we are still um, a long way off from making some of those uh, changes. So we would appreciate greater technical support, but more importantly, in addition to technical support, what we really need is greater awareness and capacity building for our military personnel to make them more aware about the fact that energy emissions need to be cut down and the military is contributing to energy emissions. So they have an important role to play. One area where I think our militaries are already playing an important role, whether it's Bangladesh or India, is they are also uh, uh, doing quite a lot in terms of uh, tree plantation, or making environmentally sustainable projects within the areas which, where they operate. So it is now increasingly common for South Asian militaries, the area that we come from, to see uh, them engaged in uh, environmental projects, ecological conservation projects. There are many examples, for instance, in Nepal, where the military is a major uh, contributor to ecological conservation. Uh, in the case of Bangladesh, the military runs a major tree plantation campaign every year, and it happens without fail every year. It has even happened during COVID times as well. So these are very encouraging signs. But again, uh, we have to uh, use some of these examples to take it forward to make the militaries uh, more responsible. And again, uh, I again want to uh, highlight one point that other speakers, particularly General Middendorf, has made, that if there is one lesson that we should take from the COVID crisis, that never again should we be surprised again about uh, things that can completely upend our world. So we all talk about strategic shock, but COVID should actually serve as a lesson that rather than time slipping through our hands, we should use the time to prepare ourselves for the problems that lay ahead of us. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Munir. Um, so I would like to invite Mr. Uh, Mr. Hugo uh, for sharing France's uh, action, France military's actions uh, regarding carbon emission reduction. As uh, French military has many operations abroad, I think you also have something to share regarding international cooperation, particularly how to help developing and least developed countries uh, in this area. So the floor is yours. Uh, Monsieur, Monsieur Hugo, I think you are mute. Can you unmute your microphone? Sorry. Thank you, Minister. I, I do agree with what has been said before by other panelists. Uh, the military must contribute to the fight against climate change along the two paths outlined by the international community that of adaptation and mitigation. Much can be done in the later area, especially when it comes to reducing the carbon footprint of support, infrastructure and logistics, as General Leonard have said. It is then a question of renovating energy intensive installations, developing renewable energies, protecting the environment, particularly in the training areas, and develop better waste management. Much has been done already in this area, particularly in Europe and France, which has been implementing a sustainable different development strategy since 2012. This effort, of course, must be pursued and amplified. For instance, the French energy has significantly reduced its use of fossil fuels for the past 15 years for its infrastructure and support missions. The defense energy strategy adopted, adopted last year defined the energy objective for an ambitious reduction of its consumption of fossil fuels, developing renewable energy, master supply chains, while taking all possibility for of operational advantages of this energy transition. That is important to underline that the MOD has an obligation to contribute to fighting against climate change because it is something which is expecting by the whole nation, by individuals, but also by organization. Uh, it's not that simple concerning operational needs, as uh, General Linden Doctor outlined. Uh, and it would be much more difficult to reduce the carbon footprint of combat platforms such as fighters, vessels, and tanks, for instance. It will take time and need important R&D and innovation efforts. R&D programs have been initiated at the national and EU levels in this regard. Moreover, the energy transition of the armed forces will benefit from technology innovation developed in the civilian field. Of course, military energy transition cannot be engaged at the expense of operational requirements and military superiority objectives. The so-called mission first principle, meaning to ensure the continued effectiveness of existing defense capabilities and ongoing military operation is fully understandable and legitimate. However, it should not stand in the way of ambitious action in terms of mitigation that look to the medium and long term. Moreover, increased energy efficiency and less resilience on fossil fuels and reducing the local footprints can actually help to strengthen operational effectiveness and even increase the safety of military personnel, in particular in logistic missions. This is an effort that must be led at national but also international level, as illustrated by the EU Climate Change and Defence Roadmap adopted in January 2021, and also the NATO Climate Change and Security Action Plan adopted last June. Both are aiming to address climate change strategic challenges in a comprehensive way, dealing with adaptation and mitigation, and both organisations have agreed to cooperate closely which will significantly help making progress 
establish common policies and standards. It illustrates that greening the defense is an area where international cooperation is both necessary and possible. And as to reply to your question on how to help the developing countries, I think that we must develop um, bodies, uh, institutions, fora where we could discuss and uh, raise awareness uh, with uh, less resilient or more fragile countries in order to share experiences to uh, to uh, to help uh, by the discussion by exchange of experience to uh, to contribute uh, to a, a more global. Uh, fighting uh, against um, climate change. Talk to you. Thank you very much. Um, let me invite last speaker, Ambik, uh, Ms. Ambika Vishwanath. Uh, since your organization is particularly working for developing countries, I believe you have a view uh, how to strengthen developing countries' capacity uh, in military efforts uh, to reduce carbons. And also, uh, I would like to invite you to touch up on adaptation side as well. So not only mitigation, what actions actually military can do in adaptation. Floor is yours. Thank you, Minister. Um, I, I have to uh, preface by saying that uh, many in India might actually chafe at being called developing in this space, um, but I, I am not one of them. I think in when it when it comes to our climate change um, and related areas, uh, we are very much developing. Um, in fact, I think even the de developed countries have much to learn in, in that space. So um, I, I, I think it's a great question as to what we can do from an adaptation space. Um, I, I just want to bring everybody back to 2004 when we had the, the devastating tsunami in the Indian Ocean region. And then a few years later, we had in 2014 um, Cyclone Hudhud. Um, now, these were both uh, and many others, but I, I highlight these because of the cost of the Indian Navy um, in the region over here. Uh, cost to many other countries as well, but... but um, uh, uh, more so to the to the Indian Navy. Now, what happened after that is the uh, the Indian Navy brought about a, a fundamental shift in thinking um, when it comes to uh, how they're going to rebuild or uh, sort of make better some of these bases. And so, this idea of having um, smart green bases came about. Um, we're still working on that in India, and I know many other countries are also doing this, and I think this is a very important part then of adaptation. Um, it's not the solution in terms of the bigger picture, but it's what we can do both as a country, but also uh, um, internationally and, and globally working together. Uh, what does that mean in, in very simple terms? I mean, how do we bring about an environment conscious lens um, to our installations, to our bases, our military, army, air force, uh, navy, all of that together? How do, how do we bring about some of that when it comes to using clean energy uh, whether it's at home or in, um, outside of our uh, home countries abroad. Um, what can we do when it comes to the procurement process? How can we bring about an environment lens to the supply chain process? Um, what can we do when it comes to decommissioning of equipment? And I think that is a very big area and a very important area, especially uh, more developed nations can, can sort of spearhead uh, because they are much Faster, further ahead than you know, an India or a Bangladesh or, or developing nations are. So when we get to that point, what can we learn um, from what uh, you know, a France or the US have done in that space? Um, what can we do with our waste management when our base is both at home and abroad, uh, whether it's at sea or at land? Um, and I'm not even going to touch about what is possibly going to happen in space um, going forward. So I mean, I think these are. I mean, they they they, they might seem like very small. Um, aspects of the bigger picture, but all put together, they will make a very big difference um, when it comes to how there is a fundamental shift in thinking in um, the way countries operate uh, their military. 
um, uh, when it comes to uh, bases, equipment? Um, how do we how do we do this going forward? How can we make it cleaner? I mean, there's a whole argument, of course, with the greenhouse gas emissions, and I'm not going to touch upon that because everybody else has said. Uh, um, um, has had really important points, um, and uh, so I, I, I don't want to, you know, come back to that. But I think if we we combine all of that with all of these other areas, possibly going forward, then um, we're going to see that shift uh, in our in uh, coming from a military defense perspective, which can then trickle down to other areas of of um, how we conduct governance and policies, uh, both. In developing and developed nations. I mean, in that sense, and I completely agree with uh, what the General Mininov said, of, and, and even General Goba said about you know military being able to sort of spearhead these efforts, um, and you know why not bring it uh, to the wider um, governance structures in in countries. Um, in that, I want to highlight. I I was um, sort of studying, uh, looking at the the NATO published its climate Act change and security action plan earlier this year, um, and I think that plan has some very important points when it comes to all of these what might be considered ancillary areas of of looking at coming at it from a more green clean environmentally friendly lens um and so i think that is something that uh, many countries can study uh, uh south korea also many years ago put some of these areas in play in many areas of their governance um and i've and we've studied that because i, I come at this from a larger climate um, disaster management perspective. So what can we learn from there? Uh, and, and, and even what India is doing in terms of, you know, creating these um, smart green naval bases. It's not hard to do. Uh, and I think it's very easily adaptable in, in many countries around the world, um, especially when you're going into in partnership with another country, uh, which might be more environmentally vulnerable than your home nation. So um, I, I just wanted to highlight some of these other areas, um, especially since, uh, Minister, you asked about uh, adaptation. I think these are some, some low-hanging fruits, uh, so to speak, that possibly can be put into play. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for sharing your views. Uh, we are almost at the end of this special session. I really thank uh, the panelists for sharing your views. Uh, best practices and ex experiences and recommendations as well. And uh, many of you actually raised the point that uh, the raising awareness to military personnel regarding cl climate change challenge and actions is important. And in that sense, I'm sure that this special session plays the role to raise awareness to military personnel regarding climate change issue. And also many of you just emphasize the international cooperation uh, to help uh, to support developing countries. Uh, therefore, I hope uh, your recommendation is going to be incorporated in next step of this Seoul Defense Dialogue. So I thank again all panelists and also the online and offline op offline in audiences, uh, and I'm sure that this uh, special session will uh, contribute to, to further strengthening uh, international cooperation by military forces regarding uh, fight against climate change. So I wish the rest of the program of Seoul Defense Dialogue be a great success. And once again, thank you very much. And some of you, I know this is very inconvenient time for you, but uh, thank you very much for staying with us and uh, your valuable contribution. So I hope you have a good day and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much, moderator, for uh, leading the session, as well as the panelists for joining us from worldwide. Well, we were able to find out that climate change is indeed closely linked to the national defense, and it's inevitable for us to now solve the uh, question. So we cannot neglect this pending issue any longer.
So once again, thank you very much, everybody, for tuning in. And at 4 o'clock, we will be beginning the special session number two entitled Enhancing International Cooperation for Safe and Secure Cyberspace. So please make sure that you will be uh, back in the room or for tuning in to the online beforehand 4 p.m. Korean Standard Time. And we will now end the special session number one. Thank you very much.
あああああああああ
Well, ladies and gentlemen, the second special session is about to begin, so may I ask all the participants who are still outside to please now enter the hall and be seated. The second special session of 2021 Seoul Defense Dialogue is about to begin. The second special session is about to begin at 4 o'clock, so may I ask all the participants to now enter the hall and be seated. Thank you very much. Yes, once again, as we are to begin with the special session number two, may I ask all the participants to now take their seats. We will promptly be beginning the special session number two here at the 2021 Seoul Defense Dialogue. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, may I ask all the participants to now take their seats. Thank you very much.
Yes, welcome everyone to the second special session of 2021 Seoul Defense Dialogue SDD. Well, at the session, we're providing Korean English simultaneous interpretation. So our viewers online, including the security experts, as well as all those who have been constantly supporting our SDD, please select the language that you wish to listen to through our YouTube channel, Ministry of National Defense, Republic of Korea. Well, as we commence the special session number two under the title, Enhancing International Cooperation for Safe and Secure Cyberspace, we're going to welcome two people on the stage to join us and also other panelists to join us online. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome, uh, with a big round of applause, our moderator, Senior Fellow Ko myung Hyun of ASAN Institute for Policy Studies, Center for Foreign Policy and National Security, as well as Professor Yu Winte, the Department of Political Science and International Relations of Tanguk University. Please welcome them with a big round of applause. And of course, other panelists will be joining us through online. Well, the cyberspace is ever more increasing due to the pandemic, and I'm very excited to find out what the uh, what the session has to offer. So now let me pass on the mic to our moderator. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon and and good, uh, good afternoon and then good, good morning and good evening for those of you who are joining us online. Um, so very much welcome to the second session of our uh, second special session of the Seoul Defense Dialogue. Uh, so, uh, enhancing international cooperation for safe and secure cyberspace. Uh, my name was introduced is uh, Go Myung Hyun. I'm a senior fellow at the ASAN Institute for Policy Studies in Seoul, Korea, and I'm the, I have the pleasure of being the moderator uh, this afternoon. So, before we get into the session itself, I wanted to give you a quick overview of uh, what the session is about and a uh, background as well. So, we are for well into the second year of the COVID-19 pandemic, and when the future generation looks back to this time, uh, they probably characterize it as uh, a great era of uh, social distancing, uh, working from home and take our food. Uh, but then we are also seeing that uh, we are increasingly taking our personal, social, and economic uh, activities from offline to online. And there are definitely benefits to that. Uh, we know that uh, a, a conference of this magnitude wouldn't be possible without the uh, cutting edge IT communication technology connecting multiple experts, uh, experts uh, from around the world. So, but then there's also downside. Uh, downside <coughs> is clearly uh, that the troubles that uh, bother us uh, offline have come with us to the online uh, world as well. Uh, so for instance, uh, the offline challenges of the cyberspace, uh, sorry, offline challenges have come to cyberspace. And some of those challenges are actually uh, more pernicious in the cyberspace. For instance, uh, the problems of misinformation and financial crimes are a lot more uh, destructive when they move from on offline to the online world. So, but then paradoxically enough, uh, the laws and frameworks that uh, regulate conflicts and enhance deterrence against this kind of threats are firmly rooted, uh, established uh, in the offline world, and then they haven't really propagated to the online world yet. And without these uh, security mechanisms or institutions, uh, traditional conflicts and familiar frictions among nations that have bothered us so much in the offline world is going to be even more amplified and continue and abate it uh, in the online world, in the cyberspace. Uh, so in my view, at least the uh, uh, theme of this session is that uh, this argument over state sovereignty uh, in cyberspace is what uh, causing and undermining, causing trouble, first of all, but also undermining efforts to bring stability and security to cyberspace. Uh, we have, for instance, uh, China and Russia who argue that uh, enhancing state sovereignty is the way to go to ensure stability of the cyberspace. Uh, on the other hand, we have uh, liberal democratic states uh, that argue that on the contrary, uh, it is the rigorous application of 
international law that will bring about peace and stability in the cyberspace. So how do we, uh, do we as an international community reconcile these two polar opposite positions and uh, make cooperation possible? So in order to answer this very pertinent and important question, uh, we have a very esteemed uh, panel of uh, five experts from around the world uh, today here. Uh, so uh, let me introduce them uh, in alphabetical order. Uh, first, we have uh, Professor uh, Brad uh, Glosserman, uh, who is a senior advisor to Pacific Forum and also a professor at the Tama University in Japan. Uh, professor Glosserman uh, is a specialist in alliance relations in the Indo-Pacific region, nuclear security, and also well cyber security, which is uh, essentially combining these three, we we'll say uh, he has uh, hit the perfect trifecta, uh, and then he's a very popular figure and very much in demand in Korea for his uh, background and uh, specialization. Uh, followed uh, by now uh, Dr. Mika Kertonen, uh, who is the Director of Studies at Cyber Policy Institute in Tallinn, Estonia. Uh, he specializes in development of national uh, cybersecurity strategies and military cyber doctrines. Uh, so his background shows that it's a perfect fit for a uh, sovereign defense dialogue, as you can see. And then we have uh, here uh, Director Sharifa Rashida Sayed uh, Othman, uh, Senior Principal Assistant Director at the National Security Council of the Government of Malaysia. Uh, she's been uh, she's been, al for almost uh, two decades, uh, been actively involved in planning and implementation of cybersecurity policies, as well as regional cyber diplomacy through the ASEAN Regional Forum. Uh, so then we have uh, Dr. Patrick Pavlak, uh, who is the executive officer at the EU Institute for Strategic Studies Brussels Office. Uh, Dr. Pavlak is very active uh, through EU Cyber Direct, uh, which is a project that promotes a uh, stable and rule-based order in cyberspace. And I think uh, many of us here who already know Dr. Pavlak through his work, and uh, we are very appreciative of uh, his work as well as the EU Cyber Initiatives. And to round up the panel, we have here, uh, luckily, uh, uh, physically, next to me, Professor Yu in of Dangung University. Uh, Professor Yu is a political scientist, uh, a very well-known figure uh, here in the field of cybersecurity, digital governance, and the middle power diplomacy that we are going to refer to later on in the session. So uh, without further ado, uh, uh, let me delve into the conversation uh, about this important matter that we have on our hands right now. Uh, so the question, the first question that I have for the panel is uh, now that the chasm is growing between the states uh, that pl uh, places priority on state sovereignty and on, the, on one side, and on the other side, uh, the states that place priority uh, in governance by international law. Uh, so what will be the way forward? Um, I think uh, in terms of uh, the order of uh, uh, speaking, I, was, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Kerotonen uh, first. Uh, I think it's properly suited to answer, uh, start this round of talks. And then we'll be followed by Professor Glosserman. And after that, uh, we'll, uh, you know, the members of the panel in the alphabetical order uh, would, uh, would give their respective answers. So Dr. Kertonen, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, thank you for the organizers for providing this opportunity to share my thoughts on this uh, politically very important uh, issue uh, at the Seoul uh, Defense Dialogue. This event has during the years become one of the most important uh, 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 security dialogues uh, organized. We wish that we could uh, meet in person, uh, meeting our Korean Dear party, idealism and happy idealism. The cynic in me does not uh, believe in the lines of actions we have taken so, so far. And John Lennon in me uh, uh, views positively more, more inclusive and explicit approaches. So the first question of, uh, of this uh, different 
disputes even on issues of sovereignty. Yes, indeed, uh, the status of sovereignty in cyberspace have really debated. Based on uh, exposure diplomacy in 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 national uh, uh, events and uh, process the dispute. The balance of sovereignty and international obligations. And for the latter, international, how are they to be set? It's more that than the sovereignty itself. Uh, in, yeah. uh, Dr. Ketman, actually, the, I mean, the connection is not the choppy. So maybe. It's the cornerstone of. Yeah, maybe we can. Uh, we, the state order and the so states. We'll move uh, to the, uh, you know, Professor Glossomer first. Secondly, and then return to you later. Uh, yeah. Would that be okay? All right. Uh, thank you. So, Professor Glossomer, so uh, yeah. please. Thank you, Sean. I, I hope my connection is better. I'm, I'm, I was worried for a moment that it was my connection. And so I'm, I'm almost, I feel a little better to hear it's not just me. Um, that said, I have a feeling from what I heard that uh, Dr. Katunin and I would, would probably agree. Um, I think the answer to your question would be a lot depends on your perspective. My sense looking at this is that diplomats and theorists would say that progress is being made. And I think you align the, the GGE with the OEWG report, you know, the, the government group of experts and then the open-ended working group. And people that are participating in that process note a broadening consensus, despite some real problems in some of the earlier processes. Um, the third GGE report says cyberspace is subject to the same general principles of international law as physical space. The sixth report added the, the 11 non-binding norms and seemed to endorse the application of, of international humanitarian law to cyberspace, even if it didn't use that term. And I think all of the discussion is emphasizing the importance of sovereignty. So I think you can make a theoretical case that there is a, uh, a seeming coming together and creation of common ground. I would, that, that's from, I think, that perspective. Mind you, I'm not a diplomat nor a theorist. My sense, though, is if you speak to practitioners, people that are working these issues, that they're going to say, this, we're not making a lot of progress, and that this is, and, and they're generally frustrated. And I, and I, I see uh, Rashifa shaking her head, so I think she's going to be agreeing with me here. Key issues are really being kicked down the road, which is oftentimes what diplomats do to avoid a rupture, and uh, it's their job. Me, I'm a pessimist. I think it looks to me like cybersecurity policy, like so much of these other important strategic discussions, and that is what we're talking about, are driven by strategic, political, and ideological considerations. And these questions of international law are somewhat subsidiary, if you will, to the broader progress that's being, or, or to, the, to the sets of issues that are shaping and ultimately defining decision-making by governments. Um, I think that that overall tendency is reinforced by the world in which we find ourselves now. And that is one that is, I think, defined by great power competition. And that this competition, while having a military and strategic dimension, is as much economic and therefore very technological. And I think that that is shifting the way that we're addressing so many of these, these, these digital considerations, cybersecurity, in both the, 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 the military, traditional military strategic uh, uh, dimension, as well as that which I think is the, the, the more broad conception of strategic in the 21st century that quite frankly is far more applicable, applicable and far more relevant into ways that I think power and rank and status and influence in the international system is going to be determined. Um, and I think you see this in terms of a, a lot of this being shaped by the new restrictions on access in the United States and throughout the West in regard to technology and as well as the, the process of indigenization of technology within China. This is an expression of this new strategic outlook, which I think we need to really be paying attention to. Um, I know time is short, so let me just conclude with one other thought, which I think will, will, well, I'm very much concerned by the vogue in the United States or the vogue in the world now for offensive operations. And the United States is very much focused now on moving left of launch when it's discussing a lot of these strategic concerns and thus, I'm very worried about the, de the degree to which offensive considerations are shaping government policy and will in, in the future. 
And this, of course, invites all sorts of definitional issues, as well as all sorts of other problems or that we, I think, may be taking up later. But this new um, readiness to engage more aggressively, to defend forward persistent engagement, whatever the particular term of art that's going to be used, all of this, I think, is going to be complicated. Um, the way that we, we address these problems. And I think we're going to continue to underscore the very, very real issues of strategy, uh, uh, political concerns that I think right now are big and sadly are only going to get bigger in the future. I'll stop right there. Oh, that's great. So, I mean, I totally agree that, uh, especially when it comes to cybersecurity, there's a supremacy of technology that actually determines what kind of policy steps we can take. Uh, so, uh, having said that, I, maybe we'll try again with uh, Dr. Keratonen, uh, but maybe this time, if uh, the connection is again choppy, we can try switching off the video and just use audio. Sometimes it helps. So let's try it again. Uh, Dr. Keratonen, please. Yeah, and my, my apologies. Uh, I thought that I was on optical cable, but the Wi-Fi was on, uh, so okay. now I oh, should have better. a like a full screen both ways. Thanks. Thanks for your patience. So uh, going back to my, my three points, the first, if, if you didn't hear it, uh, uh, or I was not able to deliver it, that the dispute between sovereignty and uh, international obligation, uh, that is the issue. It's not of, of the sovereignty itself. States uh, are not denying uh, uh, the fact of sovereignty, whether they call it uh, then a rule or principle, it doesn't matter. Sovereignty doesn't di disappear anywhere. But the question of who imposes and on what terms international obligations and on what terms we, we as states take them or, or not, that is uh, my, based on my experience, the, the key issue. So, and this, this, secondly, this dispute predates and exceeds cyber, cyber affairs. It's a question of uh, uh, link to allegations of unilateralisms and post-colonial sentiments and hegemony, uh, where uh, at least the previous American post-Cold War expedition hype, uh, the demise and hardening of Russia and the rise of China fuel, fuel this debate. And thirdly, sovereignty is not uniformly understood uh, uh, or perceived in the like-minded, the Western camp, camp, camp either. Perhaps this is more of a, of a uh, legal scholarly debate uh, and it goes uh, uh, above my understanding and, and pay grade. But most importantly, what should we do about the, those, uh, those things? Uh, I want to emphasize two approaches. First, we need to better understand uh, positions and language and meaning of concept used uh, east, west, uh, north, south, and, 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 and you name it in, the, in these processes. Uh, we can, and we can deliberately choose to look more of uh, similarities than differences. My argument is that previously we have we have uh, focused on trying to win a game that we wrong wrongly think that it's a zero-sum game. So we cannot impose, but I, I would say we can, we can uh, I argue that we have, we have an opportunity to gain, to uh, reach some consensus and understanding on, on, on these issues, including the question of sovereignty in cyberspace, and eventually start focusing on cybersecurity and not only on world order, order pro problems. So that concludes uh, my, uh, my, my first answer. And again, my apologies and thank you for your patience. No, no problem at all, uh, Dr. Keratunen. Thank you so much for your uh, statement. Actually, it's a great contrast to what uh, Professor Glosserman said earlier. There's a supremacy of technology here, and then from Professor uh, Dr. Kalatanen, uh, Kalatanen, sorry, uh, we have heard uh, more, uh, I would say, uh, more established uh, thinking about sovereignty, that sovereignty is a very important concept uh, when it comes to determining order in cyberspace. So now we turn to uh, Director Sayed Osman to hear uh, the position and the perspective from uh, different from a European or American, uh, American ones. So, uh, Director uh, Sayed uh, Osman, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Very happy to be here. And uh, for me, I, I would, uh, coming from 
uh, person that do not have any diplomatic training. And I start my career by looking into the policy part where I engage straight away to those people who look into the technological part. So let me uh, uh, try to actually uh, elaborate a little bit more on how actually uh, I see from my side. Um, I would like to touch on how actually the technology and technical capability people with the right skill can close these questions from what I feel, profound disagreement that we have in the questions given. Uh, I think we have seen in this particular matter more and more states that have played significant roles to discuss the aspect of responsible state behaviour and in this regard is cyber environment. And one thing about international law, I think we have agreed, I mean, uh, especially at the ASEAN region, and even Malaysia, we have agreed that international law, particularly the chapter of the UN, applies and applicable to cyberspace. And we also have emphasized the importance of capacity and capability building to elevate the cybersecurity maturity level of states that can contribute to a more secure cyber environment. Also, the aspect of confidence building measures, CBM, that comprises of transparency, cooperative and stability measures that can contribute to preventing conflicts, avoiding misperception and misunderstanding and reductions of tensions. Let's take the definition of CBM itself as, part, as what I mentioned earlier and put that in the level of how technology actually can assist to demonstrate if we speak directly to the cybersecurity te technical experts rather than diplomats. Uh, we, when I go to them, this is how we communicate. This is, there is already a concept in cybersecurity that called zero trust in cybersecurity, where you will not allow any device to be connected to you unless you trust the device. How do you trust the device? You verify and identify the, ident verify the identity. And how do we do that? We have technological mills to do that. So the concept of trust will materialize once you have verified. And I believe same goes in order for us in the concept of CBM that we are talking uh, right now, where there are mechanisms that we can increase the level of confidence. And in all the discussions that we have at the first committee of the United Nations, and I think we have deliberately seized at what point actually we can navigate and move further with regards to this matter. And talking about the norms itself, and I think the eight positive norms that we have and the other three negative norms for a country, I mean, at least in my experience, at my position, we need to take that and translate that into a strategy that the technical people can understand, then later the country will have a visibility. When the country has visibility, the country has an experts to, 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 to get the knowledge. The discussions that we can actually table to our diplomat, diplomat here is the Malaysian diplomat themselves, to understand on how this thing works, then it will elevate to another level that actually can be discussed more, especially um, uh, if we refer to country like Malaysia and any other countries. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, we, I think uh, uh, Director uh, Sayed Osman is uh, essentially a technological optimist and, and then we, we have to trust but verify, uh, you know, echo President Ronald Reagan's famous phrase. So let's take it, the, the, the discussion to Dr. Pavlak. Uh, he's, the, uh, he's been working on uh, cyber diplomacy and sovereignty issues and, and so definitely sovereignty issue is not unfamiliar to him at all. So let's see if we can bring some consensus to this view. Uh, Dr. Pavla, floor is yours. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you again for, uh, for the invitation. Congratulations on uh, another um, conference. Uh, I think I will partly repeat what Mika said. We usually agree, so I will uh, resonate some of his uh, ideas a bit more. Uh, and I very much like Sharifa's comments as well about the technology as a solution to some of the uh, political problems and debates that we are facing. Uh, I think it's an interesting point to come back to uh, later, to what extent actually can we uh, uh, assume that this is the case, because I think sometimes the technology is at the core actually of, uh, of those disagreements that we're having, for instance, when we talk about supply chain, security, vulnerability disclosure, and so on. So that might be an interesting 
uh, discussion to be had. But let me maybe go back to uh, your original question. And I think we need to unpack it a bit to, in order to avoid the confusion between sovereignty as a political term and sovereignty as a legal term. Um, the question might suggest that uh, in both cases it's used um, uh, in the same context, but I think it, it, it might create uh, unnecessary confusion. So I would agree that there is a broader disagreement about sovereignty in cyberspace, both politically and legally. Politically, there is this agreement about the role that states should have in securing cyberspace. That also includes the discussion about the rule of law and the protection of human rights. No government will say that they do not want to exercise control over their cyberspace and take decisions that shape it. I think Mika made that point as well. The main disagreement in terms of policy, in my view, is about the limits of those powers and the system of checks and balances to avoid government overreach. This is why, for instance, the notion of information security proposed by Russia and supported by Chinese discourse has been consistently rejected by the West. Then there is a second uh, perspective to look at the question of sovereignty, which is this legal aspect. And again, Mika has highlighted that there is actually no agreement on sovereignty in cyberspace, even among the like-minded countries. And so the division is much deeper than, than between the West and the rest. Even the West, as I said, uh, disagrees. The European Union, for instance, does not have a common position when it comes on sovereignty in cyberspace with different member states taking uh, different views. So the bigger question, I think, is not about sovereignty or the application of international law, but rather about incompatibility of views regarding the application of some principles such as sovereignty, but also at the same time, the principle of non-interference in domestic affairs, which is very uh, dear to uh, our Russian and Chinese colleagues. So how can we overcome it? Uh, in addition to technological means that Rashida has already mentioned, um, we can look at, a few, at, at those two aspects, political and legal. Politically, I'm not sure we can, and I think Brad has made this very good point of how cyberspace is becoming increasingly this uh, tool of choice or the area of choice for uh, conducting state business. Uh, so politically, the value system between each side uh, so West and the rest, if we want to keep this dichotomy, is so different that without significant change of the political systems altogether, this would be impossible to overcome. Legally, some are calling for international treaty, as you know, uh, and others rely on this responsible state behavior in cyberspace approach based exactly on the UN, uh, consecutive UNGG reports. Um, but states' interests there are so significant that we are likely to be observing the evolution and struggle Within, those years, within, within this field for the years to come. And I think the fact that we have this new open-ended working group that was launched in 2021, that it will continue in the next uh, four years until 2025, the fact that we have this ongoing discussions about uh, the program of action that has been proposed by uh, France, Egypt, but also over 40 other states, is really something that uh, we will monitor, uh, we'll have to monitor very closely. Again, uh, I think that the point that Rashida made, you know, about the capacity building, but not capacity building necessarily as, you know, let's, let's help states understand how to implement norms, but rather let's help them understand how technology actually can solve some of the political solutions, whether it does solve it indeed or creates additional spillovers and disagreements could be actually quite an interesting uh, path to look forward, something that is actually not done sufficiently at an international level. And if we're thinking about what role Korea could potentially play, that's probably one of those uh, fields where you may want to step in given um, uh, the leadership on digital transition that Korea has exercised so far. And I stop here, thank you. Great. Uh, I read I read a little bit of a, a cautious optimism I, rather than pessimism in uh, uh, Dr. Pavlak's uh, response. And uh, but then it seems like uh, there's still a, quite a gulf between uh, the, the you know among the states regarding the issue of sovereignty and which affects the possibility of cooperation. So now I turn to uh, Professor Yu for his take. Uh, maybe he can help us a uh, little bit, Professor Yu. Yes, um, so hello everyone. Uh, and uh, I would, first of all, I would like to thank you uh, for having me in this um, precious and timely discussion, dialogue. It's an honor uh, and pleasure to be part of the dialogue with your um, honorable guests and officers. 
and scholars and practitioners from all over the world. So <clears throat> regarding the first question, um, uh, let me first uh, set the stage here. Uh, then I will turn to the uh, and address the question directly a bit more. So uh, there, there are issues over which Western states and authoritarian states are contentious. International humanitarian law uh, is one of them. The international humanitarian law issue, along with the issues of the right of self-defense and countermeasures, involves authoritarian, authoritarian states' fear of the possibility that the law could be used against their sovereignty. This issue was one of the primary reasons why the uh, 2017 50 g came out with no consensus report. The 2021 open-ended working group, OEWG, uh, was the same. Outcome was of no difference. There was no mention of IHL, International Humanitarian Law, in the consensus session. Um, in addition, the consensus reports at the OEWG lacked how states should specifically apply IL, international law to cyberspace, as were previous GG outcomes. And as you all know, and I feel like preaching to the choir, but you know, I, I said I, I am setting the stage here. Uh, the 6th 2021 GG report was a turn, uh, in my view, uh, in that regard, uh, and did include the mention of international humanitarian law. It was not that the issue was not contentious at the meeting. Um, detailed discussion, however, on how to apply international law still remains absent. Um, as manifested and as mentioned by other panelists, uh, by the unresolved two-track forums in the UN, you know, program of action and uh, 2021 to 2025 OEWG. In any event, the inclusion of international humanitarian law in the 2021 GGE in and of itself can be seen as progress. Given that uh, other contentious issues, such as the need of a new international treaty for cyberspace, as claimed by Russia, have faded out um, over the course of the several GG discussions. So in my view, one reason of this kind of achievement or progress uh, was active diplomacy, especially uh, by Western states and like-minded states. Uh, in other words, in order to resolve the conflicts among states, diplomacy matters. Um, some here panelists, uh, I mean, Paul Dow mentioned the importance of technology, but still uh, clinging onto the importance of political act actions like diplomacy. Uh, so one needs to use every possible diplomatic tool, diplomatic tool to fill the gap between cyber powers, especially if, if they are in conflict. In the same way, I think states need to get uh, naming and shaming or accusation work in order to put pressure on potential or perpetrators. Uh, second, uh, I think we may hold off forming global consensus rather uh, than bogging and being bogged down to you know uh, like uh, contentious uh, discussions or debates about uh, abstract norms and values. Instead, we can focus on what is concrete and what is implementable locally and regionally first. Um, confidence building measures and cyber capacity building at the regional level or at the bi and trilateral level may be uh, more realistic uh, and pay, may pave the way for a broader application. In the same vein, uh, establishing the local best practices of CBMs uh, may be more desirable and may potentially alleviate concerns and fears stemming from discussing abstract norms and values. Each democratic slash authoritarian state has its own set of vulnerabilities to the use of internet and concerns in the use of the internet. So it may be easier to form and shape CBMs and cybersecurity capacity building that are tailored to specific participating countries. Once confidence building measures are formulated and hopefully accumulated enough, states may attempt to reconcile CBMs formed in different regions. So lastly, uh, to you know, alleviate the conflicts between cyber great powers, uh, we can anticipate, we can have some expectations for 
um, middle power diplomacy. So especially with regard to the aforementioned points, I'm going to talk about them with the next question. Thank you. Perfect, uh, Professor Yu. Uh, I think uh, we have heard from all of the, from all of the panel, uh, obviously, and then I think uh, we can summarize uh, what's been said so far in terms of, uh, I mean, uh, there's no easy way to uh, summarize this because there are different positions. But then overall, if I am allowed to give it a try, I would say that uh, there's a very fundamental disagreement in the world right now over the issue of sovereignty, obviously. And it, uh, it, the gulf is wide between the states that have opposite opinions about this issue, and it's going to be very challenging to bridge the gap. So, but then we cannot really stay or remain that state, which is uh, not, not clearly ideal. So the best way is to try uh, other uh, ad hoc, uh, I mean, I, I say that, but then, very definitely, definitely very efficient or like a um, workable method such as uh, put our hope in technology or like a try different mechanisms such as uh, CBM or like uh, international treaties. Uh, but at the end of the day, I would say, as Professor Glossman had said, uh, you know, what really uh, drives uh, the dilemma that uh, we have right now is the great power competition. And, and how other states are going to respond to that. And that's going to be the, the core of the, uh, the, the follow-up, I and mean, the second question for this session. And clearly, there's a, the possibility of cooperation is very difficult. There, there's no doubt about that. Uh, and, but then the, the, the question is, how do we overcome this difficulty? How do we somehow uh, you know, continue with cooperation? Uh, despite uh, the great power competition. And then more pertinently for uh, Korea, uh, which is hosting this uh, forum, is how middle power countries such as South Korea or Malaysia uh, should respond to this. So for that, uh, I'll turn to Professor Glosserman. I'm putting on a, on, on a spot a little bit because we're talking about major powers here. So please go ahead. Uh, as the representative of the great power in the room, um, it's. First, I think whoever put this panel together with the present company accepted deserves a real, uh, a real pat on the back because these are some this really excellent stuff. Um, I would disagree with you, John, if you don't mind. I don't think the problem is the Gulf in sovereignty. I think the problem is goes back to a no shared appreciation of risk or threat. And I think that you know the issue that we're facing is not sovereignty. We have people that are prepared and governments that are quite prepared to use cyberspace at this point to address and to advance strategic and national interests. And I, this goes into getting beyond the diplomatic niceties and the attribution issues that are really at the heart of all this. But sovereignty, definitions of sovereignty in cyberspace are not going to solve the issues that we face, which is this explosion of malware, the, you know, the, the, the ransomware attacks that we're seeing, and the way in which cyberspace is now being used as an extraordinary, a very potent tool to undermine uh, strategic militaries and, and economies. So I, I just want to put that out, and I'd be happy to hear the other panelists' response. But I'm, I, that's a very, I think, real-world sort of issue, that it isn't just this sovereignty question. Now, to go to, your, to the questions you asked, and I will be very brief, Ed, Number one, the first problem is there is no shared appreciation of threat or risk. We all look at this as different. We all look at ourselves as being, I think, somewhat immune. And I have to say, of course, the United States, while the, lately the target these days, is by no means uh, blameless in its capacities. And I would argue, in fact, that it is precisely because the U.S. has assumed for so long that it is its capabilities are so superior to virtually everyone else's that we have. That has been, created a barrier to a larger set of international agreements over time. At the same time, I think the U.S. is risk-averse, and consequently, it's unlikely to respond to adversaries when they attack and make them pay a price for hacking. And so, uh, in an increasingly gray world, that means that hacks and attacks are going to continue. Um, CBMs are valuable, but they only manage risks. I mean, and this is somebody, I've worked on CBMs in the real world in various con contexts in, 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 in Asia Pacific for 20 years, and progress is slow and progress is frustrating, and they're very limited. Uh, they're, even in theory and in practice, they're stepping stones to more substantive work, but progress in every dimension of this is a long way off. And so I think we need to be very realistic about what we can honestly expect from CBMs and where it takes us. Um, to echo Professor Yu, I think we need the broadest possible 
consensus to condemn violators. Naming and shaming is potentially valuable. And I think there's a dispute too among experts about how far we can go with that. And there's some people in the United States that think that it's the, the affirmative effects of naming and shaming are overstated. But I think we've seen some progress with the recent US EU statement regarding China. And I think Japan, for example, recently called out China for the first time on the hack. And I think that constitutes some progress, but we need to be careful about how we proceed. And, and naming and shaming alone, I think is, is not going to be enough. Finally, to middle power and in, in, in South Korea. Uh, again, I would echo precisely the points about capacity building. I think that is absolutely the most important thing to develop their ability to understand and to live up to norms. And South Korea should be playing a key role in promoting that. It can provide energetic support for in the regional institutions that Professor Yu again just mentioned. I think he's again right. We need to take it down to a local level where countries can best respond or that are closest to the, to the particularities of a given geographic space. And finally, I think it should be a model digital citizen, setting standards for CBMs and being an advocate in international and regional forums for precisely this kind of behavior. I hope I didn't go on too long, but thank you. No, that's a per perfect talk. Uh, so now that we have heard from the unofficial but influential representative of the great power, uh, let me turn to uh, our members of the panel from the middle powers. Uh, uh, maybe we can start with uh, Director uh, Said Osman, please. Thank you very much. Um, um, uh, I would like to uh, answer the second questions that, 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 that was put, where how, um, how can we foster cooperation among great powers in cyberspace? What roles could a middle power like um, Malaysia and Korea play to promote uh, secure and stable uh, cyberspace? Um, yes, capacity building um, and what I actually uh, would like to emphasize here is um, echoing what was saying uh, uh, from our distinguished speaker just now is how actually um, a country needs to understand the fundamental landscape, then only they can start discussing about the issues of international law per se. I mean, let me take by observing of what had happened all this while from my little experience that I was involved, where some countries would very much like to talk about how international law applies to cyberspace. Yes, they also participate in capacity and capability building and try to see on how they can actually build up at their national level the understanding as well as position. But at the same time, like what mentioned just now, the risk that has been uh, the threat and uh, risk landscape of each uh, countries are different. Some countries are still facing and uh, the issues of increase of cyber crime. They might not have the law to address the crime itself. They are still grasping in building the capacity or capability or even the network penetrations to, to their side. So that is another matter that I think we should also look into on how we can, we can move forward with regards to this matter. Hence why, from what I answered earlier, where the, the, the importance of country to invest and put in the strategy to understand and increase their threat visibility, then only they can understand what are out there, who are their, their actually, who are the threats and what are the threats? Are they criminals? Are they state actors? Are they just an anonymous group that actually attack them? If you look into the technical point of view, the technical um, behavior of how you actually mitigate cyber attack or any cyber incidences, it doesn't matter whether it comes from the terrorist, it comes from the state actor, or it comes from the criminal. For a, a, a computer emergency response team, they will actually act the same. But the magnitude, the spillover, what are the law that associated to some uh, incidences and how we actually treat them at national level differs. Are they cybercrime? Are they something that needs to go and escalate it to the, to the, to the aspect of state-to-state -state relationship? So having said that, uh, again, we have actually emphasised and could not emphasize more about um, understanding the importance of de developing skills as well as encouraging people 
to actually understand and speak more. I mean, cybersecurity should not be a technical issue. It should be vertical. It should be understood by all relevant policy maker as well as any other entities and stakeholders that are exist in there. Thank you. I will stop here. So that's a very good point. Um, there are, I mean, we just, uh, I mean, I just categorized uh, a number of countries as middle power countries, but that's a very broad category and clearly every country, every middle power has a uh, uh, different, under different conditions, different challenges, therefore the response will be different. So now let's turn to our own middle power expert, uh, Professor Yu, for his take. Would you agree with uh, Director Osman uh, when it comes to uh, middle power's uh, react, uh, response to uh, cooperation and great power competition and fostering uh, safe and secure cyberspace? Sure. Uh, excuse me. Um, so. <clears throat> Well, certainly it is very difficult um, for, uh, so there have been so many scholarly works about how to define middle powers, but uh, let me indulge in a sort of uh, conceptual here, um, fuzziness. Uh, and instead, uh, if I say middle powers, you can just think of, you know, South Korea, for example, and um, uh, Malaysia, and also uh, some uh, European countries except, uh, like England, uh, other countries. But, you know, obviously we have uh, great, uh, the, we have clear notion of great powers, the United States, China, and Russia, so on. So, uh, you know, regarding, uh, in circling back to the, uh, and addressing the uh, second question more directly, um, first of all, uh, and it's sad uh, to say that, I would say it would be extremely difficult to pull out any concrete cooperation between rival great powers because your, many geopolitical issues are involved and because competi competition for global leadership in the cyber domain is intense as the stakes are high. In addition, winning competition on cyberspace issues is crucial, especially for authoritarian states, so they don't want to lose the game. Uh, because uh, winning the competition is often associated strongly with their own domestic political legitimacy stability, and even regime survival. That said, I think this question may be asking about anticipated roles of middle powers in the aforementioned context. I would like to say that much can be expected from middle power diplomacy, which may mitigate conflicts or bridge gaps among great powers. Uh, like I said be just before, there are scholarly works that describe and slash or propose different types of diplomatic roles of middle powers. I would summarize them into three. First, broker. Second, coalition former. Third, norm slash best practice proponent. Uh, the latter two roles are maybe particularly relevant here in this context. So let me talk about the second role first. Uh, so in light of the middle power diplomacy uh, as coalition former, uh, middle powers can create momentum to press forward what great powers do not necessarily have strong interests or consensus uh, by forming a coalition of like-minded states. One notable example in the security domain after the end of the Cold War is Ottawa Treaty. And more recent examples from the cybersecurity domain include the Paris Call for Trust Security in Cyberspace and the Christchurch Call to Action and both of which were led by middle power's role as coalition former. Um, so maybe South Korea could be ambitious, and can be ambitious about uh, likewise. Uh, next, as norm slash best practice proponent, middle powers such as South Korea may contribute to the discussion of cybersecurity. Although being not related directly to the cybersecurity discussion, recently South Korea demonstrated, demonstrated leadership in creating Article 6 of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Dis Disabilities. So a case like this uh, can give us a lesson how middle powers and the global south may contribute to the norm creation. Likewise, middle powers can be proponents of international best practice standards. As mentioned before, middle powers may actively take on CBMs and cyber capacity building and establish 
and slash or help disseminate best practice in those efforts. Middle powers may have less conflictual interests with more counterpartners, such as other middle powers or developing countries. Informing and operating CBMs and cyber capacity building. Thus, they may be, middle powers may be more able to lay the groundwork for a broader scope of states, even including great powers. So another example in the cyber domain is the EU toolbox for 5G security. It can have implications for setting international standards and make the global discussion of norms and the application of international law more concrete, and thus ultimately contributing, contribute to making progress in the global cyber security discussion at the United Nations. I stop here. Thank you, uh, Professor Yu. Uh, sounds like um, when you put together many, many middle powers, uh, then the, this grouping of middle powers is strong enough to take on the great power. And uh, I think uh, with that, I'll turn to our uh, European members of the panel who definitely reflect in their work uh, some of the recommendations we just made. So first, I'll turn to Dr. Pavlaka, then Dr. Karatanen. So please. Thank you. Thank you again. Um, again, maybe another another point for the discussion later on. But uh, what is a middle power or what is a small state in cyberspace? I think that's the concept that have to be really re-evaluated re because if you look at some of the states that really play a re leading role in shaping this um, uh, policy area, actually. Most of the leadership, and Sharifa probably will agree with me, uh, during the latest UNGG and open-ended working group has been done by small or middle powers, if you want. These were not the big actors uh, that maybe were shaping the conversation, even though, of course, everybody paid most attention to what they have to say. But the most constructive engagement was indeed coming from, um, from countries uh, like Estonia, Netherlands, uh, partners in Asia, Malaysia, uh, Latin American countries, African countries like South Africa. So I think there is really much more to, to be said about the power status in cyberspace rather than maybe applying those traditional labels that we have when we analyze power uh, in the physical uh, domain. But let me go back to your original question about this growing conflict in cyberspace and how we can potentially uh, counter them. And I think it's true that conflicts uh, of very different nature are proliferating in cyberspace, but it would be a mistake to assume that they are only between big powers. If you look at the Middle East or Gulf countries, the use of cyber capabilities seems quite widespread there too. So it's not only, you know, US, Russia, China, but, but a much broader context. So cyber tool tools have definitely become this important element of states foreign trade and security uh, policy. Uh, but I think we need to look beyond this big powers competition uh, or conflict to look for common interests. And I think here I will agree more with Sharifa and disagree with Brad when it comes to the assessment of situation. Uh, because I actually think that uh, most of the states actually have certain, uh, a share certain assessment when it comes to uh, what those threats uh, are. All states have interest in promoting peaceful digital transition on one hand for economic growth and social development. And I think if you really look at the narrative, there is no disagreement there. So cooperation in that respect is an opportunity. There are of course new debates around security of supply chains, for instance, that cause certain um, delay or even derail some of those conversations, but that should be taking place uh, on the regulatory track. So looking at those, opportunities and topics that could be explored as part of this more technology-based or technology-grounded conversation uh, could, be, uh, could be interesting uh, in itself as a, as a maybe confidence-building measure. At the same time, states can unite around fighting common threats. So, Brad, I think here is where we slightly disagree. I mean, yes, there is this big power competition on how to respond uh, to certain threats. But I think many, uh, if not all, would agree that fighting cybercrime, uh, addressing ransomware attacks, or dealing with cyber espionage is a common threat. Whether it's China, Russia, US, or European partners, all of them actually are exposed to uh, similar vulnerabilities um, in that domain. 
all have shortages in the works for force and skills, right? Something that uh, Sharifa was already talking about. So there is a lot of common agenda that could be potentially uh, used to build this uh, cooperative framework, uh, but so far is neglected. And I think it's neglected because the political uh, debates around the field have really focused on the security aspect. And uh, Mika, myself, and a few European colleagues uh, really tried to maybe engage a bit more in the discussion about cyber resilience. So cyber resilience being really a hot potato in Brussels uh, right now, you know, how can we build it? What can be uh, put forward? How can we actually build cyber resilience to de-escalate some of those uh, possible conflicts um, in the future? Might be, a, might be a useful approach to look at. And very likely something that exactly states like uh, South Korea could use as a, as a sort of a, um, a building block for their international engagement, given the scope of uh, the digital transition that has already taken place in the countries, uh, digital programs that are being implemented. That's definitely something that, uh, and the kind of a leadership that the rest of the world, frankly, is looking for. I mean, we've all sat in those discussions about cyber diplomacy, where you know our partners from Africa, Asia, or Latin America would be saying, you know, we do not really want to engage that much in this narrative or view of cyberspace as a conflicting area. We see it as an opportunity. We look at the digital transition as something that is going to help our societies move forward, uh, whereas. Um, uh, the idea of conflicts between the great powers is something uh, to some extent that is really um, uh, distant in their understanding and thinking about about cyberspace where they're more of the observers than actually active participants so again that is probably an area that where the countries like south korea could uh, play a role and i'll stop here thank you great uh dr kertanen uh kertanen sorry uh would you agree with that uh, I echo very much what, what Pat, Pat, Patrick said uh, regarding the role of, uh, of uh, smaller, smaller states and uh, mini or even nano, nano powers in, in, in cyber affairs, as well as uh, uh, Patrick's note on, uh, on working with, uh, for example, with, with African states. Going to the original question now, great powers are by default, by default are those ones who do not want to adapt to environment, but rather want to shape and change it according to their interests. Cyber power, uh, oh, sorry, superpowers need to be uh, tend to be sovereignist, they are opportunists, they conduct operations and can be oppressive, at least occasionally. The rest of us, whether we are middle, mini, micro or nano, uh, uh, we are not in position to force superpowers to cooperate. Now, echoing Professor Yu, we can at best try to facilitate, encourage, create opportunities for co cooperation. I have four uh, somehow concrete measures in mind. Concrete that they, they perhaps are diplomatic, concrete in diplomatic terms perhaps also concrete in taking steps at home. First, I would like to stress the, that stress for us, non-superpowers uh, uh, states, to stress the importance of peaceful settlement of disputes as obligation of effort that is clearly expressed in the UN Charter paragraph 2.3, which we should promote over operational law and operational practice and the hype of uh, responses and, and, and deterrence. Secondly, we can manifest uh, responsibility by deliberately and effectively implementing the 11 recommendations for norms of responsible state behavior, the 2015 UNGGE uh, report uh, uh, forwarded. Uh, by the way, the Global, uh, global Forum on, on uh, Cyber Expertise is, is soon to uh, issue practical guidance on norm, norms implementations. They, these norms were issued uh, some six years ago and uh, implementation of them has been a uh, little bit, uh, uh, let's say, ad hoc. Uh, and, uh, and in, indirect, but that's also possible. And thirdly, 
we should not only implement confidence building measures but to develop them and not settle only for this uh, as such essential transparency and communicative uh, measures but to construct restrictive measures which could then uh, rein conflictual and escalatory cyber activities and operations and fourthly cyber security cyber stability cyber resilience start at home by home i mean the actual home office uh, and the and the state let's uh, rather become providers of security uh, than consumers of security and cy cyber security that can all states do regardless of size and and, and definition thank you so uh, I see like, a pattern emerging here. Uh, clearly, uh, I'm, I'm, it's not a new concept, but then I think it's uh, when it, in the contrast to the, our talks about sovereignty and then global power competition, we start talking about uh, cyber resilience. And I think that that's a very important concept to take into account, especially for the middle powers that uh, many of the panelists have indicated has a little influence on the behavior of the great powers. Uh, in that sense, uh, in a way, it's in the terms of a security, language of the security would be deterrence by denial. By building our defenses, by, the, by building resilience, we can essentially um, neutralize some of the risks and threats that, that are in the cyberspace today and that at the same time as the positive side effect of increasing our uh, voices in the international arena. And at the same time, we can unite with other middle powers to essentially bring together uh, and impose in the international community uh, norms and standards that can benefit everybody, not just a handful of states that, uh, that are, you know, have a comparative advantage over the others. So I think uh, we have a cautious consensus that emerged from this discussion so far, and I think that that's going to be very beneficial for uh, the audience as well. We are doing very good in terms of time. Uh, we are on track. Uh, so uh, at at a, at a normal times, at a point like this, I would turn to the audience to, for questions from the floor, but then uh, it's very unfortunate, but uh, we are not going to be able to do so uh, for many reasons. Uh, and, and then instead, we will have to take a full advantage of the excellent panel that, that we have here today. So, uh, but then I try to guess, uh, given the composition of the audience here, uh, uh, I, I think our panelists online cannot see them, but uh, many many of our members of the audience are defense attaches and uh, uh, and also uh, specialists in security, so and military affairs as well. So I tried to come up with a question that could uh, speak for them. So the question for the panel, uh, the follow-up question is, it's more about uh, how should the military uh, respond to an attack, cyber attack by uh, non-military uh, actor. Uh, essentially, I'm asking about what will be the rules of engagement in this kind of case. Should the military defer to the civilian authorities and let them handle this first? And and what point and what scale of attack should the military intervene? So uh, it could be, uh, this is a very specific question, but I think it uh, uh, speaks for the audience here. Uh, so let me start with uh, Dr. Kalatanen and flow by uh, uh, Professor Glosserman, and then, then I, I'll turn to other members of the panel. So, Dr. Kaptanen, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, dear participants, I served 33 years in, in uniform uh, Finnish uh, light in, in infantry, and therefore I'm very cautious about the, uh, about the use of the uh, military defense forces, uh, armed forces in uh, in overall cybersecurity uh, issues or, or, or questions, I regard uh, the use of uh, of uh, defense organization, the military, however we name it, as as the last resort. Of course, uh, uh, defense forces possess enormously good capabilities, which can be used for, uh, for forest fires, floods, uh, uh, search and rescue, and cybersecurity as well, in intelligence in included. But there are two uh, risks here. One is that we 
Securitan size and militarize uh, cybersecurity, cyber resilience issues by handling it over uh, to the defense sector. And secondly, and I would say as importantly, we should not delude our armed forces, militaries, from the hard edge, uh, the, the very sharp edge, and the use of violence when when needed. We uh, in the in the in the defense sector, yes, we can do a lot of things, but we should focus and stay focused on 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 our issues. So, apply with caution is is my my uh, answer to this question. Thank you. Okay. And I yeah. think I'm. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm, you're, uh, it's your turn. Yes. Okay. I, I'm. Um, I feel like I'm. My role here is to be the bad guy. Um, <laughs> to disagree, but uh, and and if I have a chance, I'd like to follow up on that. But I, actually, I agree very much with Mika. I, I, I'm. Uh, I too think that we should be cautious. I do think that, of course, it should be the civilians that are, you know, certainly responding first. I think the military, on the other hand, sadly, and, I, and again, for, for much of what I'm trying to, to describe is not normative, but descriptive. I'm, I'm sadly trying, my, my analysis reflects the world as I see it, not as it should be. Um, and I agree with most of what other speakers have suggested about way we should, how should we be responding. But at this point, it certainly looks to me like in the United States, the military has been giving an increasingly free hand to reply to some of these attacks. And um, they're being let loose, and I think that's incredibly dangerous. The problem, too, though, is that really legally, in many cases, certainly in the United States, private sector does not is not entitled and cannot hack back legally. And it's only the military that has both the capability and the legal um, authority to do this. And um, the problem, so so you have all of that, and then the final wrinkle to all of this, unfortunately, it, which I think we've sort of glossed a little bit, is the degree to which so many criminal groups or some of the most important ones are in fact instruments of the state even though the attribution issue is never clear that what we're seeing is an a, a, an instrumental instrumentalization of some of these organisms whether and and we can discuss it if you will but i think we all know who we're talking about are actually if you will deniable assets of the state and thus a military response merely by by the the the, the party that's been attacked is nothing more than an attempt to you know compress that 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 distance and to make very clear the relationship between you know actor and state power and we're kidding ourselves if in fact we think that these are non-affiliated groups in many but not all cases and the question then becomes attribution and our confidence and what does that mean in regard to legality etc as we try to address these threats and that goes back to the point that i was making about some countries are i'm afraid are using uh, or, or believing that, the, that we can use these these new modalities as instruments of state power, and sadly, I think the United States has been as guilty without empowering some of these other, or doing the same thing, but without doing it the same way. Mm. That's uh, that's a very enlightening and then provocative uh, uh, response. So let me turn to the rest of the panel. So perhaps uh, we can start with uh, Dr. Paplak, and then then uh, Director Osman, and then finally. Uh, we professor you wrapping up the, the this uh, round of talks please uh. thank you yes i, I think I will, this time i will agree with brad where, where we have to you know uh of course we have certain ideals that we would like to uh, believe in and uh, uh, the fact that there are certain rules of the road that everybody is following but at the same time i think the realists in us accept the fact that, uh, you know, there are certain states with uh, quite well developed capacities, not only uh, defensive, but also offensive, which I think also sort of shaped your questions about, you know, the role of middle powers and, and sort of underestimated the role they can play, because exactly, you know, who pays attention to the countries, even if they're great uh, entrepreneurs on the normative processes or the discussions about international law, if they really have no instruments to execute that. So, indeed, there is this dichotomy there to, uh, in our discussions that are very much linked to, are you capable to enforce what you're preaching? And I think that's something that, uh, uh, that Brad was referring to. Now, this should not really prevent us, indeed, from having this conversation about what is the relationship between military and civilian uh, parts of the governmental forces in, um, within the countries. 
And first of all, I think we have to really acknowledge that different countries have very different setup when it comes to the organization. Sometimes it might be that the state, like it is the case in Colombia, for instance, has a Ministry of Defense in uh, uh, charged with the main responsibility for all aspects linked to cybersecurity. And that means it's not only the defensive element, which comes as a last resort that Mika was talking about, but also this preventive and protecting element that in, uh, in some other parts of the world are executed by civilian agencies like the one that uh, Sharifa represents. So I think there is really no uh, one size fits all response, uh, response to that question. Uh, but when we talk about the difference between the military and other types of civilian actors, I think we also have to acknowledge that each of them has their own missions and objectives. And I think the most important thing is really to make sure that these duties are clearly uh, defined and delineated. Uh, they each also may come into picture at a very different stage depending on the national arrangements, as I have said. Uh, in some countries, again, the military might be responsible for protecting national networks or critical infrastructure uh, from cyber attacks. Uh, and we know that very often the military itself actually relies on the civilian infrastructure uh, for performing some of its functions uh, domestically or internationally. So again, uh, that ch those channels of communication and cooperation have to be uh, clearly uh, defined. Uh, but when the law enforcement uh, fails to pursue, military can, for instance, step in again. So there is this certain time element, I would argue, when we think about those relations where you have military responsible for defending at the end of the spectrum with law enforcement and other civilian agencies stepping in to pursue and prosecute, very often protect. Uh, but again, at the end of the spectrum, when everything else fails, military might be stepping back in. And I think, uh, you know, the doctrine that uh, Brad mentioned, defense forward, was exactly to some extent response to the failure of the civilian agencies to actually uh, ensure that the objectives that the US government has defined are achieved. So this deterrence by denial that, uh, that you have mentioned earlier has not been achieved. So now what we're trying to do is think about this defense forward and defend uh, and deterrence altogether through alliances uh, and different um, uh, other tools. The important thing is no matter what the setup is, there needs to be a proper set of checks and balances in place and the full compliance with uh, the rule of law. And I think that this is where we're having uh, some big disagreements uh, among, the, uh, among the great powers. They not necessarily disagree with, uh, among themselves about the role of the military in the cyberspace, but where they do disagree is how is military used and for what uh, and for what aims. Uh, when we're talking really about non-state actors, I would still argue probably that uh, the civilian agencies, law enforcement uh, mechanisms are the primary tools. But we do indeed have seen the fact that when states work for proxies, it is almost uh, impossible to, uh, to execute that. The EU's cyber sanctions regime was introduced as a complementary mechanism exactly to address those cases where pursuing a cyber criminal has really not been an option because they do not travel or uh, you know they do not have bank accounts uh, in other countries so it's actually difficult to uh, to sort of pursue this accountability or bring justice uh, in that domain and i'm cautious of time so maybe i'll stop here thank you so that's actually a very comprehensive and broad clarity to the question that uh, I have posed to the panel. So uh, we are clearly uh, a little bit short on time, but so let's turn to Director Osman. No, I think I'm just going to be short because I mean, most of the things that um, Patrick says is something that I echoed. Um, uh, for us, I think uh, we have uh, acknowledged that military exists in the same platform, same environment, and it's very difficult for you to distinguish that. Of course, there are technology that you can use that, but no, uh, I don't think it can be separately, completely separated in order for us to, to act in terms of environment. So in our country, of course, our, uh, the organizations, National Cyber Security Agency is the national cert, but at the same time, according to our National Cyber Crisis Management Plan, we have a link with the military so that, as mentioned by Patrick, to the last of defense, who are the actor? The moment when the CERT 
understand the actor where the elements of technical visibility, the element of understanding who your actor is very, very important, the depth of information that you have, that is where the link came. So um, as far as I'm concerned, we are uh, in Malaysia, we really recognize the stakeholder. And also another part that, that, that I think is very much important, military also depends on the critical national information infrastructure, where most of the where they also depend on the interoperability of the energy sector, of the, of the communication and multimedia sector to be connected. So hence, uh, at the early start of cybersecurity management and mitigations in our country, we actually include military, but milita military only came in when the last of defense and they have different uh, mechanism and doctrine, but they are in the community to understand our national threat level at the particular time. Thank you. That's, that's a very succinct and great answer. So, Professor Yu? Yes, so um, how to facilitate cooperation between the military sector and uh, the private sector? So, I think every nation has its own problem on coordinating domestic actors involved in cybersecurity. In my view, one of the most typical problems is related to information sharing between the two sectors, private sectors and the military sectors, regarding losses, threats, risks, and slash or measures to deal, to deal with them. So rapid information sharing with as many as actors concerned is crucial to minimize the damage and loss from cyber attacks, given the widely spread hyperspeed digital, digital infrastructure. Ideally, seamless and 100% transparent and rapid information sharing between the two parties, between the two sectors, would be the best solution for all. However, there are drawbacks in information sharing, and thus one, of, one must be careful how to devise and implement a mechanism of information sharing between the two parties. So for the military, I think the military should ask, whether it is willing and ready to share intelligence and military secrets, which are often associated closely with national security matters, share those with private companies. The military would need to share intelligence about sources of threats, diverge which department of the military is at risk, and slash or make transparent its present measures to cope with imminent threats. However, as you all know, Sharing these kinds of information have potentially serious, serious drawbacks, not only in the military capabilities, but also in the national security. First, because intelligence sources and cyber capabilities of the military might lead to adversaries as well as allies in the process of information sharing. Um, because uh, you know, those information sharing might reveal capabilities of what the military is able to do and what the military is able to know. As a consequence, the military's intelligence and capabilities to cope with future threats would be substantially hamstrung and even be neutralized. Second, if the current military capabilities to deal with cybersecurity threats are known to potential perpetrators, whether they are state-sponsored or not, their next step measures to cope with threats can, be, can also be outsmarted. I think, again, I'm preaching to the choir here because there, is a lot, there are a lot of military officers and experts here. Um, but uh, to stress uh, and just to remind, uh, therefore, what to share and who to share become vital questions for the military to decide before facilitating cooperation with the private sector. If the size of the circle, I mean, composed of uh, the military and the private sector, is too broad, then in, there are incentives to uh, large incentives to free ride. If it is too small, then information sharing between amongst the parties uh, in the circle would not be as much effective. The private sector has its own difficulties too uh, to participate in coordination efforts within the public, with the public sector, such as the military. First, because companies would like to avoid legal liabilities stemming from regulatory obligations. Once it is known that they have not taken appropriate measures before any damage is done or an accident occurs, they might be subject to legal liabilities. 
So there is an incentive to engage in liability dumping in which companies avoid recognizing vulnerabilities in their system or share information related to their own breaches. Second, companies might not want their vulnerabilities to be shared with the military and to report any breaches to the military, especially in regard to their proprietary skills or techniques. Because such news could spread quickly, especially to stockholders and competitors in the information sharing process, therefore the stock price of the companies would plummet and the competitors might take advantage of their vulnerabilities. So the military needs to set up and operate the mechanism very carefully to protect corporate interests and to keep afloat corporate incentives to share proper proprietary information. Okay, uh, I stop here. I think that's the uh, point of my uh, second, uh, sorry, sorry, third answer. No, that's a great response and then very helpful and then really contributes to uh, to discussion. Um, so, I mean, sadly the time is up. Uh, even though, I mean, I, if it's maybe just me, but it felt like uh, we are just getting started. Uh, we are started with, the, uh, you know, uh, multilateral corporations, you know, bringing, making cyberspace uh, safe and secure. But then we start talking about, uh, you know, like a defense uh, forward and then deterrence by denial. So very complex subjects and then issues and concepts. And, uh, and also, I think uh, from the panel, I mean, I think uh, many in the audience will agree with me, uh, but I think uh, we got very valuable uh, insights from the experts in the panel. And then implementable recommendations, especially for middle powers, uh, such as Korea. And I think uh, that's going to be uh, a most uh, well-noted uh, contribution from this session, I hope. So I think uh, well, overall the consensus uh, sounds like that what we should do going forward is uh, pretty much stay the course. Uh, the future is uncertain. Uh, we don't have a per perfect instrument to handle this very complex and then humongous challenges that lay ahead. But then and, uh, we are doing our best, clearly. Uh, so uh, let's, uh, you know, let's keep our fingers crossed and then do our best. And then now, uh, please join me in thanking this excellent panel uh, for with a big round of applause. <laughs> so thank you very much. And then uh, thank you again for your valuable contributions. And so hopefully we will Next time, uh, we'll be able to bring you in person to Seoul so that we can extend this discussion uh, after the session as well. So with that, I'll wrap up my session. Thank you very much, moderator. Of course, there's no panacea, but uh, through discussions like this, I am confident that we will be able to move forward. So thank you very much once again, our moderator, as well as the panelists for leading the session and for the fruitful discussions. Well, with that, we will conclude the session and tomorrow we will be having the opening ceremony as well as the plenary sessions tomorrow. So please stay tuned and we will be ending the day one here at Seoul Defense Dialogue. Until now, I was your MC Shin Thank you. Goodbye.